read for Larry Jones. And Larry is part of the writer's duo over here with Dee and Larry, and they are great members of our group. And Larry is working on a novel that's kind of a cross between 1984 and Roots. And uh, this, is a, this is the prologue to the book, so it really basically tells you what, what the, this book is all about. Uh, and the, the title of the book, I think, eventually, Larry, is this right? It's going to be called Human 2? All right. So, it is the year 2114. This won't mean much to you right now, but keep it in mind. My name is Gina. I don't look like Gina, but what can you do? I am an H2. That won't mean much to you either. It means everything to me. To explain this, I should go all the way back to the beginning. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution, they provided for protection of scientific inventions. Great idea. No one ever thought it would one day come to mean humans. I am a patented device. My owner, Zygon Corporation, owns me. They created a device and a method for growing fertilized human eggs in an artificial womb. They obtained patent protection for the DNA, the process, and the results, H2s. So I am just another piece of merchandise, like any other invention on the shelf. There is very little unique to me by human standards. I come with all the normal parts and accessories. I get sick and bleed just like any human. I can't have babies. They felt that they had to leave out something to make us different from humans. But we think <clears throat> and interact just like any other humans. We were raised by human caretakers, led normal lives as children except we had caretakers instead of parents, not unlike orphans. I even earned a college degree in engineering. But no one has made an offer to buy me for my engineering knowledge. Apparently too many engineers around. Over the years, the earth has had been so decimated by global warming there was a big demand for engineers to help rebuild the infrastructure needed for continued life. The seas now polluted, the air and water so filled with the toxins of past industrial life as to be useless without cleaning. <coughs> Most of the population now live in domed, covered cities to avoid the toxins. The United Nations consolidated all politics and power in one organization. The governments of the world joined together to fight the pollution and the global warming through the UN. The domed cities provide some measure of normalcy in our lives as they provide a healthy environment and normal temperatures. Solar energy powers the city, which allows the cooling system to keep temperatures at a comfortable level. There is not always sufficient sunlight due to the many storms that develop each day caused by global warming. For H2's, daily life is whatever our owner decides. We came to be because gene scientists working on mice got the idea to create smarter and stronger children. They modified human DNA using CRISPR and other new tools to remove genes and add parts to create a customized modified human DNA. The DNA was injected into a human egg and sperm, and a sperm combined to make the first modified human. The process was perfected, and soon the factory was turning out 200 new humans a week after the usual nine-month wait. The babies developed in an artificial womb and received the nutrients a human mother would provide. So, I am owned by a couple with two children, and I am their nanny. Life is comfortable for me. All H2s are not so lucky. This is the year 2114, and man has ventured into the outer solar system with colonies on other planets, like Mars. 
There they have developed mining colonies and shipped valuable minerals, minerals like lithium back to Earth. H2s have always been used for the most dangerous jobs. This is especially true in the mining colonies. The death rate among H2s is 10 times that among humans. On Earth, the violence rate toward H2 is 20 times that toward humans. H2s have been killed off at a high rate among Earthlings. This violence toward H2s includes murder, rape, torture, and general abuse. In spite of the violence, in, in spite of the violence laws meant to predict a, meant to protect H2s, it happens. There is no explanation except hatred toward H2s. Earth social society is a complex structure in which H2s provide the means through which mankind now lives a life where all aspects are controlled and optimized for humans. Every conceivable thing, from temperature and humidity to light intensity. Mankind now has a utopia in which his every wish can be achieved directly by him or through an H-2. H-2s do everything from pilot spaceships to design all the dwellings we occupy. They build the buildings and run the factories which produce all the products humans need. They work in all the companies who do business across the colonies of Mars, Io, Europa, and Saturn's moons. Nothing grows, moves, breathes, even lives without the involvement of an H2. Living my quiet, comfortable life, I was shocked the first time I learned of an organization called H2 No More. A piece of paper with their emblem on it turned up in my cart while shopping. The paper talked about an organization devoted to stopping the H2 program and freeing all H2s. It also contained a warning about the penalties for anyone found working with the organization, including death for any H2. However, I was curious. Through meeting with various members of the organization, I have learned of even more brutal attacks on H2s and humans trying to help H2s. I have learned that there is a group of humans and H2s who are working together to free more H2s who are ready to leave their owners, but for now are staying undercover and working as if everything is normal. Why am I telling you? Uh, why am I telling you all of this? Because I am streaming this live on an illegal channel for all to hear and see. H2s are going to take over the world. So Larry, we look forward to, uh, to more to come in this book. Now, next is going to be Dee Organ. She is our poetess. She will read some of her poems. Oh. oh, you got it. Yes, I have learned to use microphones because I always need microphones. <laughs> no one ever hears me otherwise. Uh, I just completed work. The last, just read the last chapter of the book I've been putting together. Uh, it's a memoir uh, interspersed with poems about my husband who died from dementia, uh, which is similar to Alzheimer's. That Alzheimer's fits under the same umbrella with that. And I'm going to start out with a poem that I had in that book, and it's called Cruel Disease. To families dealing with memory loss, it is a cruel disease. It takes away the like you have in any sense of ease. The worry is constant. There is no relief. You struggle with sorrow and feelings of grief. As I watch pieces of him fade away, I hold on to the thought he'll be whole someday. The Lord will restore him to the one I once knew, make him whole again as good as new. And I'm going to go on to something a little lighter weight. It's growing old. Growing old is the pit. <laughs> you develop aches and pains and your body quits. Your hair deserts you and your waistline too. 
Heaven only knows what next your body will do. <laughs> Running up the stairs used to be a breeze, and now you wheeze along and pamper your knees. You have to watch the things you eat. What you used to love is no longer a treat. You lay in bed instead of sleep. You twiddle your thumbs and count the sheep. But thinking about the alternative, I think I'll grow old and still live. <laughs> the next one I'm going to share with you is called Handicapped. We are all handicapped. On some, it shows, but many are visible only to one who knows. A wheelchair crutches these things you see, but no one knows what's inside you or me. It's a handicap to be too shy. If things you need to do, you're afraid to try. Prejudice is a handicap, too, when you deal with people different from you. The handicap there is for all to see doesn't change them internally. But those whose handicap we see should be treated the same as you or me. Wishing for sleep. I wish that I could sleep as round the house I creep. My brain won't go in to park as here I lay in the dark. I don't, don't want to wake the sleeping one. So that I'll watch the black on black and wait for the sun. <laughs> this one is called Endless Circle. Are we always doomed to do as our parents did? I wanted things to be different for my children than when I was a kid. My, kid, my parents seemed so unobservant and missed things that went on. Yet I hear the same said of me now that my kids are grown and gone. How do you break the circle? How, do, how will the change come about? I pray the Lord will help my children find the way out. <laughs> Thank you. And I will be followed by uh, Beth Grings Grigsby's piece, who's going to be read by her husband, Jeff. Hello. I'm Jeff Grigsby, husband of Beth Grigsby. Beth wrote a book and published it last year. We're not going to read this one this year. It's called One Excellent Adventure, and it's about our summer of 1972 when we were young and free. No children. What we're going to read from now is Beth is working on a new book, and it is a character named Lottie. She's married to a character named Lovell. They have two boys named Charlie. So age 12 and Glenn age 10. And it takes place in 1891. And she's having an affair with Stephen. <laughs> and she has known Stephen since second grade. And um, it's a work in progress, so it has no title. So we're just gonna start at the beginning. Spring of 1891, chapter one. On a farm. High on a riverbank overlooking the St. Croix River in Wisconsin, western Wisconsin beginning in 1891, Lottie guided the back end of horses and the plow through the rows in the fields. She cut down weeds or planted seeds, and after 16 years, she was tired of the life she led. She wanted to rid herself of being at the mercy of the weather, the goodness of the bank, the isolation she felt, and other things. Mom, what's wrong? Charlie asked after slamming shut the outside kitchen door. He saw something in her face. Being the eldest of the two boys, he felt it was up to him to ask. Oh, nothing, she replied, bending to remove a cookie sheet from her wood-burning stove. The smell of fresh-baked gingerbread cookies filled the big kitchen front room and two flowery-looking bedrooms of the house on a bluff overlooking the river. Then there was their second son, Glenn, two years younger than Charlie and full of mischief. For a 10-year-old, he already knew how to harass his brother. No peace for the family. Those two went at each other constantly. Come on, Charlie, time to eat. I'm coming, then I'm going to play outside. He turned to Glenn. Me too, but I get to be first. Lovell ambled in past the storage room and into the kitchen, but his mind was still out there. I could use some help in the field. You know, I want to get the corn in if I can, he said to Lottie. They finished the big noontime meal Lottie prepared. <clears throat> Lovell sat back and tried to pick out strands of chicken stuck in his teeth. I'm ready to get back to work. You're coming? Lottie replied, I'll be right there. 
She gave the kitchen a quick glance, got up, tidied the room, and said to the boys, I'm going to the field. See you later. But Lottie was thinking. How Lovell worked hard for them was the best dad. What could anyone at want? Now what to do about Stephen? He's getting in the way. I only see him once a week when I go to town. He is turning into a real problem. She sat down at the round oak table. Her hands held her head. Her dark hair lined her face and her mouth curled down. And Stephen entered her mind again. She saw him. For a moment, he took her into his arms and kissed her over and over, anticipating what was to come. This dalliance has to stop. I have other things to think about. Love all the boys and, and, of course, the farm. Her face wrinkled. Now she heard inside just thinking of Stephen, and she wanted to cry out for him, but could not for fear of being discovered. Her inner turmoil made her slump in her chair, but her body tingled with excitement at just the thought of Stephen in this situation. Someday this will be different, she said to herself. And then we're going to skip a little bit. And today was the day. Looking out of the kitchen window, he heard Lovell. Lovell, would you please come here? Lottie called to him from their front bedroom overlooking the river. She sat on the bed, gathered her courage, felt her muscles tighten, swallowed, and stared at the door. Lottie knew Lovell would enter. I'm leaving you, she began. What do you mean? I mean, I can't do this anymore. Lottie's hands trembled. She sighed, and the lines on her face hardened, and only then did she find the strength to tell Lovell. Lovell stood over her at their bed, his arms folded, and his eyes on her, and he remembered only one time before at Charlie's birth when her voice sounded so serious. I knew something was wrong. I thought it was this. You've already made up your mind. He knew her well. What's going to happen to me and the boys? What is bothering you? We can work it out together. Lottie's shoulders fell and her entire body went limp. It's really happening, she thought. They talked for a while, and then she got up, went over to Lovell, straight, looked him straight in the eyes, and said, I wish we could have talked more about this. I never felt like I belonged here. It was always you and the boys, and I was here only to make a home and to be like a hired hand. She never mentioned Stephen or their relationship or how long they had been together. Um, so I'm going to put a plug in. Everybody come to the concert on Monday. St. Petersburg Community Band, I play in it. Uh, <laughs> um, next storyteller is Mary Bice. Let's give a hand for that. that I should have catechism lessons to prepare for my first communion. Edwina was in charge of our little mission church. She wore her hair braided and wrapped around her head, forming a crown, and she ruled as a queen. In the winter of 1939, when I was seven years old, the very informal town of Culpeper catechism classes were started. The four McGuire boys were invited, but seldom came. Anna Marie Rue didn't come as she was in high school, and Jimmy Thornton was a baby. That left Johnny, my brother, Mary Ellen, and me. Mary Ellen, who was also in high school, had just moved into the house beside Edwina and had not received confirmation instructions. She was pressured by Edwina to join our group. Each Saturday morning, we gathered in Edwina's living room for our lessons. The room was crowded with old furniture, giving off a musty smell. Bookshelves on each side of the chimney and a big brown heater in front took up a lot of space. 
but there was still room for the upright piano and a flowered sofa for us to settle. There was a ceiling vent over the heater to keep Uncle Andy's bedroom warm. Uncle Andy was Edwina's elderly cousin. When he was a boy, he fell out of a tree and had a brain injury. The sudden death of his parents <coughs> led to Edwina taking him in to her home. Uncle Andy was raised as a Baptist, but was unable to attend church. That's why Edwina opened the ceiling heat vent and we Catholic children became a Baptist choir. We scrunched around the piano trying to read the words. When we learned them, we rang, sang Rock of Ages, In the Garden, and Amazing Grace with gusto. One Saturday morning, Uncle Andy, in his blue and white seersucker suit jacket over his pajamas, was sitting on the front porch. He was still swaying back and forth in time to our final hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. When he stopped me, Johnny and Mary Ellen ran along home. What is it, Uncle Andy, I asked. I want to show you something, he said, with a snaggletooth grin, laying his Bible aside, scratching his white beard. He innocently took my hand as we stepped off the porch. We walked over to a spot under the oak tree. In his soft voice, he said, stand right here and look down. I don't see anything, just grass. Look again. Nope, there's just grass. He leaned down and plucked a four-leaf clover right by my shoe. How lucky you are, Uncle Andy. No, I stand still, trust in the Lord, and look. While he sat on the porch watching me, I squatted down and frog-legged back and forth across the yard. I found one. I really had seen another one, but I left it for Uncle Andy to find. <laughs> reading is by our leader, John Michael Miller. <laughs> Mary uh, just completed a, a whole series of these stories about Culpeper, Virginia, that I'm sure is going to be a delight uh, to the whole town. And we're going to convince her to submit this to the local uh, historical society or, or uh, whoever might be interested in it. But there are all these charming, wonderful things about a long age, long gone past. And, uh, so I want to give her a hand for completing this. <laughs> we're going to finish up now. And uh, before we do, I just want to thank Myra, who put her whole being into putting this together, and her husband, Bill, who, um, who has provided all of this. And for all of our writers um, who have worked really hard, uh, we're all pretty serious about what we're doing. And for all of you for coming out today, it's a beautiful day. You could be in the pool, but here you are. Now, um, we often write, as you can see, about little incidents in our pasts. This is one of mine. The title of this piece is Balls, Strikes, and Prepositions. <laughs> it was my first season of umpiring. I was a grad student at Penn State, and to earn some extra cash, I worked two nights a week, two seven-inning games, on local slow-pitch softball fields, and often did weekend tournaments as well. Some of the fields are out in the sticks, towns in central Pennsylvania like Baileyville, Center Hall, Belfont, and Bowlesburg. State College has several fields, too. It's manly work, and starting out when I don't know exactly what I'm doing, 
I take a lot of nasty heat from big, hairy guys with massive forearms and cheeks bulging with chewing tobacco. Hardly intellectuals, they are, however, masters of rendering the devastating put-down. Ampy is a good one. You should eat more carrots. They'll improve your eyesight. Or, hey, four eyes, save up the money the other team's paying you and get some new glasses. These are the milder variety. When the guys get steamed about a final out at home plate, which would have tied the game, they really let loose, as do the partisan in the usually rickety stands. Hey, a-hole, I hope you take a good shower when you get home, because you had your head up your butt all night. <laughs> Here's the best one I've heard so far, but you have to think about this one. The trouble with you, umps, is you don't care which team wins. <laughs> I, however, take that one as an unintended compliment, lauding me for my neutrality. But it's a manly thing to be able to take that kind of criticism for decisions you believe in. Such honest, direct responses seldom occur in a seminar room when I present my theories about the ambiguities of Hamlet's relationship with his mother. From the veteran umpires, I learn a few good tricks. Old Jake Salskiver, who wears suspenders as part of his uniform, tells me, look, they say we're prejudiced for one team or t'other. But what I say is, damn right we're prejudiced. We're prejudiced for the defense. Huh? I say. What do you mean by that exactly, Jake? Too complicated for you, professor? Okay, here's what I mean. Listen up. What do we want, huh? We want to get the game started and get out of there as fast as we can, right? Pick up our pay, go home, put up our feet, put our feet up, turn on the ball game, and have a cold one, right? The sooner we get our 21 outs, the sooner we go home, right? Yeah, I think I know what you're getting at, Jake. That's right, the cold one tastes mighty fine, right? Yeah, it sure does. And on a close play, you're going to take a pile of crap from one side or t'other, right? Call them safe, one side yells at you, call them out, then the other side gets on your case. Well, that's right, Jake. There you go. Now, if you call them safe, the game goes on longer. So you might as well get the out. Anything close, don't hesitate, young fella. Ring the SOB up. Get the, point, get the out. Never thought about it like that, but I see what you mean, Jake. <laughs> Same for balls and strikes, Jake says. Anything close, call it a strike. Make them swing the damn bat. <laughs> Another of these salty guys, Charlie McDonough, tells me the trick to use on the fans who want to know the score of the game. Most of the fields we work on don't have scoreboards, and if they do, they don't function. Furthermore, it's not the umpire's job to keep, to keep the score or even to know the score. It's probably better if he doesn't know the score because it might influence his call. Say, for instance, it's the bottom of the last inning, two outs, and the score is 15 to 3. If you know this and there's a close play at first and you call a runner safe, the game could go on another half hour or more. If you know the score, you might be tempted to call the out just to get the damn thing over with. Of course, Jake Salskiver wouldn't hesitate to ring the SOB up. Anyway, Charlie continues, say some fan comes behind the backstop and yells, Hey, Blue, what's the score? If you don't know, which you usually don't, you're placed in a delicate situation. If you say, I don't know, the fan shouts back, What do you mean you don't know? What kind of ump are you anyway that you don't even know the damn score? Charlie spits, looks at me. Did that ever happen to you, Professor? Not so far, Charlie. It will, son. It will. You see, fans think it's part of your job to know the score. So they say, it's your damn job to know the score. Now, there you go. You've got to explain the various non-requirements of your job. And this can get you involved in a lengthy conversation when the game is supposed to be proceeding. 
And almost always, it leads to the moron fan sitting behind the backstop and heckling your ass the rest of the night. Understand where I'm going with this? Uh, I'm not sure. Here's what you do in this situation, Charlie tells me. When the moron fan asks for the score, look him in the eye and tell him five to three. <laughs> five to three, Charlie? What if it isn't five to three? He don't know that, and he wouldn't have asked in the first place. <laughs> now a definite answer, he'll go away happy and leave your butt alone. Right, I get it, I say. What if he asks me what inning it is? Tell him, top of the third. Walter Holman, who smokes a cigar while he works, tells me a funny story, claims it's true. He says he was getting fed up with a particular pitcher continually questioning his calls. In slow pitch softball, the pitcher has to toss the ball in an arc between 6 and 12 feet. When Walter calls the pitch a ball, he doesn't like to have his judgment questioned. This one pitcher, each time Walter called ball, the pitcher yelled, where was that pitch at? Finally, instead of Walter telling him it was inside or high, he answered, son, didn't you learn in school you don't never end a sentence with a preposition? <laughs> <laughs> this was intended to throw the pitcher off balance, verbally speaking, so they'd <laughs> shut up. But, Walter says to me, these gorillas are sometimes smarter than they look. And the next pitch comes in outside and high. Ball, I yell. And be damned if that pitcher don't holler, where was that pitch at, asshole? <laughs> <laughs> With all the trouble of this job, though, every so often, after the final out is called, a manager comes over and says, good game, Blue. That's a really nice feeling in a business where praise is rarely heard. And I get to go home in peace and have that cold. <laughs> So let's give a hand for all our readers. Yeah. And we have an overload of food. So if you have a basket or something, please feel free to, to help us. Am I out of line by saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. And thanks again for showing up. Take it home.